yeah, in praying and pondering what I should speak about this morning, an illustration came to mind. Now, when I was uh, about 15 years younger, I lived on the North Coast. And uh, one of the beauty, uh, beautiful things about living on the North Coast is the ability to go out on the ocean. And um, I had a boat that was barely there, <laughs> 16 and a half footer. Well, that's pretty small when it comes to the ocean. But there's uh, certain times that you can go out on a smaller boat like that. And uh, in this particular occasion, we uh, launched at Kitimat. My parents had come up to visit us. And we decided, I, because I'd been out there and the fishing was tremendous and the scenery was even better, whales and all kinds of really neat stuff. It's one of those things, you know, like in, in the caribou, we have certain things that you go show people when they come. Well, up there, um, I had the ability to go out on the ocean, so I wanted to take them out in the ocean to experience this. And, um, you know, the, he was calling for a bit of wind and a bit of chop, but nothing hugely out of the ordinary. So what we were going to do is uh, we were going to put out, and, and I had a tent and everything, and we had this mooring place all planned out for the, for the evening. We'd, we'd camp out at this place, and I'd set anchor. We'd row to shore with the little dinghy I had. And then um, the next day, we'd come back out. So we start down the channel. And as we start coming down the channel, I look ahead, and I can see what appears to be a line in the water. And I'm going, oh no. There is a gust of wind coming down the channel. And in this particular channel, when it comes from the ocean, from the big ocean down the channel, look out. So this gust ended up smashing into us, and I say smashing because the waves in the sea rose to four, five, six feet. And in a 16 and a half foot boat, you're in five, six feet of water. It's everything you can do to keep things under control. The waves were washing over the bow of my boat. So we had a canopy and it was washing up over, my, over the canopy and the tide changed and the tide was bucking us too. And, and I'm trying to get to this mooring place while it's still daylight. And we're about three quarters of the way there and I'm crying out to God and my spirit, protect us. My parents are literally freaked out. Everyone is freaked out. you got to understand, it's not just my parents, my family. Like, we're all there. And, uh, yeah, it does not look good. So, anyways, we, we managed to struggle to the port where we were. And the, wave, the seas were so heavy that the waves were bouncing off, off the rocks and were even fairly large inside the sheltered cove. So I put everyone ashore, and I went out, and I slept overnight in this cove, trying to make sure the anchor didn't move, so I never got a wink of sleep. And the gale just blew. <sighs> as Christians, I believe our life is a journey. It can actually be likened unto a boat that sails the seas of this world, while we're en route to our eternal harbor. There are times when we're living our lives in relative serenity, enjoying the sunshine of the blessings and the gentle lapping of the water against the bow of our hull. Under these circumstances, when there's plenty of sunshine and balmy weather, life can be a pretty pleasant ride. You see the scenes, the sights, it's beautiful. But as most of us understand, the weather on the seas of life is not always sunny and balmy. Sometimes a gale can come up out of nowhere and blindside us. And at one point we're enjoying the sparkle on, of, the, of the calm waters, and then all too suddenly things change. The clouds roll in, much like what happened with me and my family out on the channel. The skies darken, the winds pick up, the waves begin to stand on edge as powerful breakers begin to smash into our lives. Just a short time before this, we were comfortable 
enjoying this beautiful weather. And now we find ourselves in the middle of a full-blown storm. The wind is howling. The rain falls on us in raging torrents. And we find ourselves just scrambling, trying to survive the tempest. Now there's a story in the Bible that I want to key in on this morning that is about a storm. And it involved Jesus and his disciples. I believe this storm story has significant insights for us as we approach the journey that our lives are taking. Would you please turn with me in your Bibles to Mark chapter 4, and the story is told in verses 35 to 41. Mark chapter 4, 35 to 41. That day, when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. And then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. One of the significant things that stands out to me in this story is that before they departed on the journey, they were with Jesus and he was the one who had the idea to travel over to the other side. They were on the Sea of Galilee. And the very invitation of Christ to set out for the other side, when you think about it, it suggests that this journey would be completed successfully. When Jesus tells us as his disciples that we are going to be going somewhere, we can rest assured that he will take us through and we will be arriving. Now, this is a very encouraging thing, as there are promises made by Jesus saying at the end of the journey that we're on, in this life that we're traveling on, at the end of the journey, on the other side, we're going to be joining him. In John 14, as Jesus was preparing for his mission of giving his life as the sacrificial lamb of God to be the sin bearer for the world, he was preparing his original disciples for his departure and he would be going to the Father. But he didn't leave us alone, did he? He sent us another comforter, the Holy Spirit, who is the down payment assuring us of the, of the, of the glory of the future. But before his mission was accomplished, before Christ's mission was completed on the cross, he wanted to encourage them about the journey that he was going to be taking and that all of us who believe will be following as we follow him. In John 14, 1, we read this. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My my father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, I would have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that where I am, there you may be also. You know the way to the place where I'm going. So Jesus tells his disciples this before he goes to the cross. And they weren't quite sure what he was talking about at the time. And they questioned him. But 
When Jesus was being crucified, he hung on the cross between two thieves. We're told in this story in Luke chapter 23, 39 to 43, Luke 23, 39 to 43, we're told one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly for what we are getting, or sorry, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what did Jesus say in response? Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, Today, you will be with me in paradise. So, when you consider that story, with what has happened, we know that Jesus was going to be with the Father God in paradise after he was crucified, where he promised that he would be preparing a permanent dwelling for all those who believe in him. He came back and then showed himself, and then he was resurrected, and he... he, sat down, he resurrected, and then he ascended into heaven, sat down at the right hand of the Father, and he's preparing a place for us that when he comes back again, he's going to receive us unto himself. That where he is, there we may be also. This is very good news for us. As believers in Jesus Christ, this is awesome news when we're sailing the seas of life. When we encounter the fierce storms along the way, we know that the Lord has promised that we have a destiny to be with him. And that destiny arrive, means arriving on the shore on the other side to spend eternity with him in his house, which will be located in the paradise of God, which is unequal. We don't know exactly how it's all going to be looking. The scriptures give us hints. But it's going to be glorious. This place is going to be beyond our wildest imagination. We're not even, we can't even comprehend how awesome this place is. We're going to be with Jesus forever and forever. All our troubles, they're going to be over. Isn't that an amazing thought when you, when you just think about that? All the struggles, all the trials, all the things that, that come at us in this world, it's all going to be washed away. They're going to be gone. When Jesus and his disciples ventured out from shore, they went out as a group of followers. While it's true that we are out on the sea of life and our life can be likened unto a boat and you think of that as being alone, look at this story. As disciples, we are linked to one another and we travel together out onto the sea to go to the other side. The disciples went out onto the sea. They were separated from the crowds. They were with Jesus, and they were traveling together. Groups of Christ's disciples travel together because Jesus has called them to travel together, to cast away from the shore, and to cross to the other side together. But here's where it gets interesting. As a family together, the disciples were not expecting a furious squall to come up on this journey. The waves pounded the boat and were such that they were breaking over it. And the boat was nearly swamped. It was a furious storm. Now squalls can come up unexpectedly, much like my story. Maybe the storm coming against us is a, is a financial storm. Maybe the storm is relational. Maybe the storm is over an identity crisis. It could be a personal storm. It could be a corporate storm. Maybe the storm is a health crisis. Is it personal? Is it corporate? Maybe both. There are various storms in this world that come at us and hit us at different stages and they're unpredictable. 
The storm that hit Jesus, disciple, Jesus and his disciples on the Sea of Galilee had terrifying ferocity. And they were scrambling about trying to stay afloat. But where was Jesus in the midst of this storm? They had assumed that they were safe because the Messiah was with them. Were they wrong? They were mad at Jesus for his seemingly lack of concern for their safety. Jesus was not worried. He was not scrambling. He wasn't even stirring. He was fast asleep in the, in the boat on a cushion. This bothered the disciples. They were on the verge of sinking, and here was Jesus snoozing away. The disciples woke up Jesus and asked him, don't you care if we drown? Maybe when one of life's storms hits us, we find, our asking, we find ourselves asking where God is in the midst of it all. Sometimes we get mad at God. Does he understand, not understand that we're getting pounded so relentlessly by these ferocious waves and this wind and the torrents of rain? He's silent in the midst of it all and the waters are breaking over our boat, nearly swamping us. Are we about to be swamped and drowned? Does he not care that our lives are falling apart? As disciples, we are in this boat together. And it is human nature for us to question when things like this occur. We can question God when the times are rough going. I wonder if the disciples on the boat in our text were arguing with each other about what they should or shouldn't be doing as they were facing the storm together. Quite possibly they were having sharp words with one another, disagreeing whether they should do this or do that or not do this or not do that. Remember that many of the disciples in Jesus' story we're speaking about, they were seasoned fishermen. They had been in storms before. They had experienced them. They knew the ways of the seas and how volatile things could become, and they were all terrified by this storm. We see in this case, when the disciples roused him, Jesus was not in a panic. As a matter of fact, Jesus simply stood up, looked out at the waves, and said to them, Peace, be still. And before the disciples' eyes, the elements were shifted. The wind immediately stopped blowing and the waves went calm. The storm was ended with one utterance of the master. Jesus briefly chided his followers, didn't he? He chided them for fearing and not trusting him to carry them to the other side. He commented to them and he said, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? You see, it was Jesus who had suggested that they cross over to the other side together. They did not realize, they did, but they didn't in their humanness, who he was and the power that he possessed. The wind and the waves are subject to Jesus. And what he, had, what he said was done without delay. When he orders something to be done, it is done. He is Lord over the elements. They, on the contrary, were in full-blown panic. When we have storms come against us, and we falter, and we're finding that the howling gale around us is drawing our attention away from the Master, in our natural humanity, our faith gives way to fears. The same question is asked of us when we're in our storms. Why are you still afraid? If perfect fear, love casts out all fear, the original Disciples didn't totally get the nature and person of the Lord. They still needed to learn 
and to grow in their trust of him. I guess that's what it means to be a disciple. It's to learn. We're no different people. Even after everything that the disciples had seen Jesus doing in their presence, they were still prone to getting their eyes on the waves and the circumstances around them. In our personal storms, do we not recognize who is the Lord over the storm? Although Jesus has gone ahead of us to the Father's right hand to prepare a place for us, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, has come and He has made His home with us. No matter how the winds of this world blow, no matter how fierce the gale blows against us in whatever circumstance we're facing, God dwells inside of the believer. So the Spirit of Christ is living in us. Sometimes we need to stop and let this sink in. At least I do. I don't know about you. As disciples of Christ, you realize we are loved by God. He is our Father. He has called us away from the crowds, away from the shore, on our journey to the other side. But my friends, you are not only following a system that leads to heaven, you are following a person that leads us to heaven. And that person is the Lord God Almighty, the one who set things in their foundations from the beginning of time, the creator and the sustainer of all things. Therefore, what shall we fear? Nothing shall separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Savior. Absolutely nothing. Oh, when, the, when the original disciples saw the power and authority of Jesus, Mark tells us that they were terrified. And they asked, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. The blinders were off. The one who had calmed the storm was the Almighty, the creator of all things. God in the flesh. Emmanuel, God with us. They had been so irreverent of him by asking him if he cared whether they died or not on this, in this storm whether they drowned or not. The one that they had treated so disrespectfully when they were in their crisis. He was more than just a man. Do you see the revelation in our present storm? Who is the Lord who walks among us in the middle of life's raging seas? John was part of that crew on the lake that day on the Sea of Galilee. And John also saw his Lord unveiled at the beginning of the revelation of Jesus Christ. It starts in Revelation chapter 1 in verses 4 and 5 when John addresses the seven churches in Asia Minor saying, John to the seven churches in the province of Asia. Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and ruler of the kings of the earth to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. What this is suggesting, my friends, is that Jesus our Lord is our servant king. He is ruler over everything. He is Lord over the kings of the earth. There is no government, whether it is a democracy, an authoritarian dictatorship, a communist regime that is not under his authority. The leaders of this realm all bow to his will. The sin of the world is responsible for the storms that are coming against our ship, my friends. I ask you today, who is Lord over the storm? Jesus. Do we see him as John saw him? As 
or as the disciples suddenly recognized him for who he was on the day in the waters on their boat. We need not be terrified by the ferocity of the gale that at times pounds against the hull of our lives. We need to be filled with a holy dread for who is in the boat with us in the midst of the storm. He is no ordinary man. He is the Lord of the storm. Listen to John's description of the unveiled Savior. Note both his response to the Lord and the Lord Jesus' response to him in return. Revelation 1, 10 to 18 says this, On the Lord's day I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, Write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. As I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands and a man dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and, the, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was shining like the sun in all of its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and now I am alive forever and ever and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Jesus, Lord over the storm, in his unveiled glory is brilliant beyond description almost. His face shines like the sun. His voice is like a thundering waterfall, like a trumpet that gets your attention. Seven represents Totality, the perfection of God. What is being said here is that Jesus walks amongst his churches, and in fact, he holds the universal church in his hand. His royal robes and unfathomable wisdom displays the brilliance of his glowing authority bathed in light, the light of his own presence and being. The word that comes out of his mouth cuts through the nonsense to the very core of every issue that was ever or ever will be. When John saw this spectacular vision of Christ and the nature of Jesus revealed, he fell at his feet as though dead in terrified awe. But who was this Lord over the storms. This Lord over the churches. This Lord over the governments of this world. This Lord over the very fabric of the universe. Would John be consumed by his terrifying presence? No. Jesus came up to him gently. He placed his he places his right hand on him. <laughs> what does he say? Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. You see, when you or I come into a storm, individually or collectively together, on the seas of this life, the powerful presence of Jesus Christ, our Lord, is with us. He will never leave us or forsake us 
or abandon us to the elements that are around us, smashing into our lives. He's going to be with us to the very end of the age. He has the first word in calling us out into the waters to journey with him to the other side. But more than this, Jesus has the last word in that there is no tempest that can overturn our boat because he has decreed that we are to travel to the other side. Sometimes in the midst of the storm, we panic and our eyes turn to the raging elements around us and our emotions get going and we get revved up and we might be tempted to think that he doesn't care if we drowned. But in the midst of it all, it's easy for us to forget this nature of Christ. Jesus is Lord over the storm, my friends. He is Lord over the storm. The storm that we're facing as a society, the storm that we're facing as a church, the storm that we're facing in individual lives, he is Lord over it. If we perceive apathy on his part in keeping us safe through it all, we are mistaken. He is not apathetic. He is not slow in keeping his promises as some understand slowness to be. But he is being very patient with this world, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. So the call goes out and his patience means the opportunity for salvation for those that don't know him yet. So he calls. And you are his church, the bride of Christ. He's called us to a mission. We need to go together and stop looking at each other in panic and having this dissension He's calling us together to the other side. We just need to turn our attention to him and trust him. No more panicking. Let's trust the Lord and move together. This morning, the Holy Spirit is calling his church to recognize him for who he is in the midst of these gales, to see him as his disciples saw him after he spoke to the winds and the waves obeyed him. To see his majesty as John saw him in the revelations. And finally, in the last scripture I'm going to read to you, to see him as the apostle Paul saw him in Romans chapter 8, 38 and 39, which reads, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, Neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Musicians, would you come forward? Jesus, we give you praise because you are the Lord in the storm. Lord, forgive us. We confess to you, God, that sometimes we, we take our eyes off of you, Lord, and we're consumed with the raging torrent and the waves that beat against the hull of our ship. But Lord, you called us to the other side and you, te- you told us, Lord, that you would take us there. So we trust in you, our Savior, Lord. You are our Savior. You're our God. We trust in you and we ask, Lord, that you would forgive us for our lack of trust in you. Help us, Lord, to look at you and to look to your word and to, and to march with the orders that we're given and to have lives that are filled with your joy and the strength that rises when we wait upon you. Forgive us, Lord, for trying to walk this road our own way. Help us to be united together for your kingdom. Father is eternal, and you're calling us home. And very soon we're going to see you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You're coming soon. Lord, as your church, we cry out to you, Lord.
Come quickly, Lord Jesus. But we know that your patience is great, O oh God, and that you long for others to come to know you so that they can be saved and gathered into your barn, O oh God, and you've called your church to be ambassadors for you. So, Lord, find us faithful. Help us, Lord, not to focus on the storm, but to keep our eyes on you and what you have said and to present the gospel in word and in deed to a world that needs to hear because they're dying and they need you, Jesus. Help us to have the same love for them as you have for us. Lord Jesus, have mercy. Help us not to be lukewarm, not to be apathetic in our approach, and not to be self-focused. Help us to see beyond ourselves, to see you for who you are and what you've called us to participate with you in. Thank you, Jesus, for each person that's come here today. We lay our hearts before you. In Jesus' name, amen.